I want to welcome all of you today here. If you are a guest visiting, uh, if you came here for the first time, uh, thank you so much for choosing this uh, place to worship with us. We'd like to meet you, to greet you, and to welcome you again in our church. Now, uh, I want to invite you to open your scriptures again in Matthew chapter 12. And we have here a passage that i always been uncomfortable to preach from it or to preach about it. Uh, because there is a theological issue there, I never had an answer for that, and I tried to avoid it. I tried to say, you know, Jesus said he knew more than it is written here in this passage. And I probably never remember myself preaching from this passage. And uh, I don't know what happened when I made a decision to choose this passage. An idea came into my mind. I said, okay, I'll preach about it. And uh, let's read again that passage from Matthew chapter 12. And uh, you see here, <clears throat> Jesus said, when an unclean spirit goes out of man. You know, I like grammar, and if it's English or Romanian, I don't like Greek grammar that I take right now, a class at Andrews. Uh, but they taught me to think of every word that's in the passage. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man. That means there are two possibilities that this verse says they are. One, the unclean spirit stays in a man. That means there is a possibility for an unclean spirit to be there, to live with me in my life, to be present there all the times. But the Bible says, Jesus said, when an unclean spirit goes out of man, that means it's possible that, that the unclean spirit will go out of that man. That means it's possible. I cannot say, this is my life, this is my destiny. I was born in this culture. I was born with this religion. I was born with this unfunctional family. I was born with this destiny. No, the Bible says the unclean spirit can get out of a man. The Bible doesn't say how and for how long that unclean spirit was in, in that man. But that's just a fact. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Now, um, I don't know a lot of spirits. I may know something about good spirits. When my wife uh, has a good night of sleep, in the morning, she's super happy. That means that's a good spirit. That's a positive spirit. That's a spirit from God. And I saw that spirit in my life too. When I have a good night of sleep, when I have good food, when my life is not as stressful, friends, I see a lot of good spirits in my life. And guess what? I share them with others around me. And they have some kind of good spirits and they respond to my good spirits. And we have a wonderful fellowship when all good spirits communicate among themselves. And this way we have better families, this way we have uh, better uh, uh, churches, uh, better societies, because we allow all good spirits to communicate and to have a, a party together. Now, the Bible says this bad spirit or evil spirit for some reason, got out of that man and goes through dry places seeking rest. Now, I don't want you to go right now and to Google uh, bad spirits finding rest in dry places. But uh, there, there are some theories. They say bad spirits, they are not at peace when it's a dry place. They have to find uh, water in order to find rest. I don't know. I didn't spend a lot of time researching on this idea, but somehow they, they make themselves comfortable in at home in a lake, in a, a water, uh, in an ocean or a sea. Remember a story in the scripture when uh, Jesus uh, healed some demoniacs? And the Spirit asks, asks his permission to go into that swine, and they went together into the uh, Sea of Galilee, and they, uh, the swine was destroyed. They died there, and the people in the area, well, they were very mad. Uh, that was the bad spirits 
going fast and fast and fast to the place where they belong, may, they may say, where they find rest. The Bible sometimes, I was uh, a child in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and a person in um, our church, he usually prayed for church, corporate prayer, and he always used an expression I never forget. Lord, take all our sins and throw them into the sea of water or something translated from Romanian. And I imagine, I never went to the sea during that time. I imagine if I go to the sea, I will see a lot of sin, sins there floating because of his prayer and because of people believing that all our sins, they go into the deep, into the sea. I don't know. I didn't make a research to see, but the Bible says this unclean spirit goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Now, this is not a problem. I can go, I can live a, a good life without knowing every detail from this verse. But the, uh, the verse that troubles me the most uh, comes after this. Then he says, the Spirit says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. There is a Greek word there that uh, translates this expression put in order um, with the, um, the meaning of being decorated. It's not just swept and empty, but the house is decorated. If uh, Becky and Teresa, uh, the best decorators in Madison area, uh, they understand what does it mean to be decorated, to, to spend a lot of time decorating and putting things in order, in season, and so on, Christmas time, springtime, fall time. The Bible says this um, house was uh, empty, swept, and put in order. Verse 45 says, Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and then dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. I don't like what uh, it is uh, written after verse 44 because it's not fair. The man that got rid of that bad spirit, that evil spirit, was so happy. And he said, I am super happy. I got out of this. I am free at, at last. I want to start a new life. And he starts sweeping his house of his soul, of his mind, of his faith of his existence, and he throws away stuff from his life, from his uh, uh, behavior, and he decorates his house and everything. He says, wow, I never experienced this kind of peace. I never experienced this kind of joy in my life. This, for the first time, I'm born again. For the first time, I have a life. For the first time, I have a, a, a perspective. I have a better destiny, a better perspective. And what a life I have without any bad spirits in my life. But the Bible says the evil spirit comes back home and says, this is my house. Actually, if I look at my driver's license, I still have the address here. I vote in this neighborhood. I know everyone here. Plus my friends, evil spirits in the neighborhoods, they communicate to each other and they have a fellowship with one another. Man, what kind of fellowship is that? They are very close friends. He said, I cannot live in a dry places, in a desert. I need someone that supports me, that nourishes me, someone that uh, entertains me. And he comes back. And the Bible says, he's surprised. The house is empty. That means no other person is there. The house is swept, is swept. That means they use the vacuum cleaner. And um, that's my job at my house, if you didn't know that. Um, and decorated. Everything is beautiful. Christmas time, lights, beautiful. And he said, I cannot come by myself. I don't know if I am uh, welcome by myself here. I have some good friends. And the Bible says seven others, and they come and they make that life house miserable. Worse than before, worse than ever. 
The theological problem I have with this passage is, I know there is no empty house. And how could Jesus use this image of empty house? Because we are never empty. Either is the Holy Spirit in our lives or the other spirit. Either I am following the Lord or I am following the, uh, Satan. There is no such event in my life when I am empty in the valley of decision. I make decision to go from one place to another, to jump from one boat to the other. I made decision to change the course of my life, the direction of my destiny, yes, but just from one side to the other, but there is nothing in between. Too many people think today they are in between. But friends, I want to disappoint you. You are not in between. There is no such empty house. There is no such in between. You know, give me three days I'm thinking about. You know, three days you stay on one side or on the other side, more or less. Um, but theologically, it doesn't make sense because there is no neutral place where you can stay. The Bible doesn't say how long the house was uh, empty, swept, and decorated. It's not Jesus' intention to talk about theological, to respond to my dilemma at this point. There are other passages, clear passages in the scripture that addresses that issue. It's very clear. What I was afraid is not, uh, is not real, and this, answer, this uh, passage doesn't answer my problems right now. But what Jesus wants to illustrate here is, is this. Being sincere, it's the first step. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, desiring a new life, making changes in your life, uh, cleaning your house, your life experience, behavior, it's a wonderful thing. Trying new things in your life, it's excellent. But the Bible says, trying by yourself, just decorating, making yourself presentable, it's not enough. Because sooner or later, the same demon can come back into your life. The same things that bother you for years can come even stronger. And the Bible says even stronger than before. Seven times. And the, your situation can be worse now than it was at the beginning. And you are sincere. You wanted a change. You wanted a reformation in your life. And you ended even worse than before. That's why, friends, I discovered this in my life. Every time I keep my house empty, even if it's cleaned, swept, decorated, but it's empty, I'm the most vulnerable, and I am opening my door for any kind of spirits out there. Even spirits, I'm never familiar with them. And even spirits, I said, I am strong. I'm not addicted to them. I'm a role model. But as long as I keep my house empty, they come and they bring their friends and they take over. Now, Jesus said at the end of this passage, so shall I also, it also be with this wicked generation. What kind of wicked generation is this? Because this last sentence, so shall it also be with this wicked generation, gives me a clue. What is Jesus talking about here? I thought he was talking about me. I feel guilty because I want to have a good life. I want to manage my life. I want to be in control of my life. I don't want to submit to anyone. I don't want anyone to uh, make my schedule. I have a busy life. I don't need anything else. I, am, I want just a decorated house, a swept, minimalized, not many much stuff. What is Jesus talking about? If you take a look at the whole page, you see a debate between him and the Pharise Pharisees and the scribes. Before that, they ask the sign. Uh, verse 38 uh, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. 
And he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the signs of the prophet Jorah. We don't read the whole passage. You understand? The message, the parable of the empty house, it's about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those who kept the law. Also, if you go back, verse 33, a tree known by its fruit. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its uh, fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. He's referring to them too. If you go back, verse 21, 22, then one was brought to him who was a demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw, and, uh, and so on. And also, it was a debate, in verse, uh, actually, in the whole chapter of chapter 12, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. People in the, from the pulpit, um, they were upset with that. And now, if we go back to the unclean spirit returns, or the house, empty house, we see that Jesus uses this parable to teach people this valuable lesson. And he says like this, you are a Pharisee, you are a Sadducee, you are the one that keeps the law, he, the one that wants, doesn't want to defile with anything, you have your house uh, swept, you have your house uh, decorated with a lot of good stuff, but if it's empty, you'll become worse than worse people in the world. And Jesus uses this parable to illustrate what happened to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's a decorated houses, decorated house, but empty. In another time, uh, in Matthew 23, he mentioned about the very decorated tombs. From outside, they are very decorated, but inside, you remember uh, the story. Friends, I don't want to discourage you today, do not keep the law. I am the one that I am a legalist. I am the one that promotes principles. I am the one that we, we, we want to follow God's uh, will and God's principles. But friends, the bad news is, if we, are, we, if we stop just there, to keep the law by ourselves, to keep the Sabbath, to pay tithe, to come to church, to be part of a ministry or another, in our house is empty. Just regulations, just do not do that, just do not touch that, just do not, you know, stay away from that temptation. Uh, it's not a place for you, just empty and decorated, it's not enough. The Bible says in, uh, I have this verse here, in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. I never put these verses together. But now they make a lot of sense to me. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Let's read. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overpowered, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandments that was passed on to them. See the principle that is here? The Bible says it is better to not know anything and to do evil things than to accept Jesus Christ in your life, to dedicate your life to God, to be baptized, be part of a church, to be part of his kingdom, and going back to the old lifestyle, the Bible says it was, it was better to not know anything. Because when you know God's will and you do against him, I become worse than that. I can add here, seven demons can come and join the, the one that, I am familiar with, and they may destroy my life forever. 
That doesn't mean the Bible promotes stay away from knowledge. Do not know more because you are responsible. But the Bible presents responsibility in relationship with knowledge, in relationship with our experience with God. That's why the Bible promotes the idea of uh, um, filling our house with something. And we have uh, the passage in Romans chapter 7, and I invite you to open there, because there are several verses that I would like to show you. They are there. Uh, Romans chapter 7, a debate Apostle Paul had with himself. And we start with verse 21. Find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, that means in my body, wearing against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members or my body. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You know the debate. I'm not here for the first time to show you what happened to Apostle Paul. He said, there is a law in my mind, a law that agrees with the law of God. We are in unity. I love to do good. I love to speak positive words to people around me. I love to help them. I love to sacrifice. I would like to see myself among those who serve God and serve others. This is what I love. And Apostle Paul says, but there is another law in my body that's against my desires, my good desires, against my good spirits. There are some other demons inside of me that are against. There is a conflict. Whenever there is a call, the good spirit says, yes, say yes, say yes, say yes. The bad spirit says, no, no, don't do that. You are the only one who did that. You are the only one that is left to do that, and so on. And there is a debate in our minds when there is something, the good spirit and the bad spirit. Sometimes the good spirit is more powerful. Sometimes the good, bad spirit comes with his friends, and they are seven plus one, eight, against the one good spirit. And friends, this is life. And Apostle Paul had this debate in terms of... Um, <coughs> that conflict and that unhappiness in relationship with sin and in relationship with the addiction of a sin in our lives. And he says uh, this, uh, uh, it was hard for me to understand this expression in English, wretched man as I am. I thought that's a positive thing. Uh, later I discovered it's not a good thing, it's not positive. We sing about that, we have a song that uses that expression, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? From this body of death can be decorated. This body of death can be cleaned, swept, nice. We spend two hours in the mirror before we come to church. But friends, that is still a body of death if the Spirit leads us and they took control. But the, the most... Uh, powerful thing I see in this passage is what comes after that. And I read from uh, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Apostle Paul doesn't say, I thank God I had a great moment. I had an illumination moment. I came into my senses. I finally realized what God wants me to do. Finally, a story from the past where something in my life made me strengthen up my, my life. Now the Bible says, he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the Lord of God, but with a flesh the law of sin. In verse uh, 1 from 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, I underline the expression who are in Christ Jesus. And the New Testament uses our relationship with Christ different ways, different uh, um, uh, expressions. 
Sometimes we are in Jesus Christ, but most of the times in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is in us. You know those verses that says, Christ in you, Christ in us. Friends, Apostle Paul gives us the um, key of sweeping our house, cleaning, and even decorating. That's good. Decoration are, are wonderful. But filling our houses in our lives with Jesus Christ. If we just want to take care of ourselves, to become presentable, decent people, wonderful uh, believers, we've done something, but not a lot, because the bad spirit is coming back, and he invites some guests for, for the dinner. But the Bible says, invite Jesus in your life, but according to the spirit. Um, now, I want to read again. Therefore, ver uh, 8 verse 1, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And for the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. If you have time, read the whole passage because it's an explanation of, of this conclusion that we see at the beginning of this chapter. There is no condemnation. There is no uh, slavery. There is no uh, bad spirit back in my life. Why? Because I listened to the Holy Spirit. I invited Jesus back in my life. The house is filled. It's occupied. There is no one else. There is no empty room for anyone else. But Jesus takes control of my life. Someone can say, How? Can you give me an example, a practical example? Be example because we always read this in the scripture. We always knew this, but how? Friends, I'm not here to tell you. The Holy Spirit will tell all of us what to do. But I saw in my life, any time I was busy with doing good stuff, good, good things, I forgot about the evil spirits. I forgot about addictions. I forgot about bad things that can come into my life. I had issues with sins as always have. And as long as I concentrating on my sin, and I got obsessed with the sin, I, I, I was ruined spiritually. And in, good, and in good faith, I wanted to solve the sin problem in my life. I did, didn't work. But as long as I invited Jesus in my life, and as long as I started my day asking, Lord, what can I do for you today? What's your plan for me? What's in store for me? In following his script, his program, his schedule, he kept me busy, friends. He kept me busy. And I was happy after everything I've done, where I, where I was involved in. And I forgot about the little guy here that already left my house. I forgot about that. People who get into trouble, they have a lot of free time. This is not in the scripture, but I will ask the Lord to wrote that at the end of the page. On the book Second Titus. People who are not busy doing good stuff, they have a lot of troubles. They invite a lot of troubles in their lives. I admire people who are involved in God's mission in a way or another. In church, outside the church, community, whatever. You want to do something for others, you bring joy in your life and bring joy to others. When you just decorate your house, you keep, keep it empty, nothing, no reason to wake up in the morning. Guess what? You are vulnerable. And I'm vulnerable too. Now, Jesus used this parable to teach people in his time a lesson. Do not be like those Pharisees. They keep the law, but their life is empty. God sent me here on purpose to fill their life with joy. And Jesus says, come to me, Matthew 11, 28 and 29, and I will give you rest. I will give you joy. I will give you peace. In Revelation chapter 3, 20 says, I'll knock at your door. At your door. Invite me in. You know, I don't want to invite Jesus because I don't have anything to feed him. Friends, he has his cooler with him with food 
and perfect water. Anyway, when he says, I want to come in your life, it's not to consume your life. It's not to, not to waste your life. I don't have any leftovers for Jesus or he will see my soda in the refrigerator. Um, he brings joy. He brings happiness. And he brings uh, uh, that kind of presence that fills the life with meaning. This is what I want for my life. And from time to time, when you can, I can share with you the secret. Every time I preach, I preach about myself. Even if I don't mention that every time because you'll fire me. You'll say, we don't want a sinful preacher. He has too much problems and he uses our time to deal with them. Friends, this is human, human being. We live in this world. And I discovered people in the Garden of Eden, they had their, even their issues. Uh, people uh, in the apostolic sort, uh, circle, disciple of Jesus, they have their issues. They have the greatest teacher in the world. And there are just 12 of them and they had issues. After Jesus left, the Holy Spirit came upon the church and they preached the gospel with power. Uh, thousands were baptized, but they still had, they had their issues. That means I am part of the crowd. And probably, I invite you to think of yourself too. If you think you are decorated, if you think your house is swept, think if your house is filled. Think if Jesus is there. And today is another opportunity for all of us to be sure he's part of our lives, to in invite him back. Lord, I kept the closet out of your interest. I open the closet for you. And when you open the closet, you have an expression here, the skeletons come out. The spirits come out. And when you open, finally you open the last closet in your house, you'll be super happy. You don't have anything to cover. And you'll be honest. And you'll enjoy a freedom as never before. This is the prayer for me, for my family, and for all of you today. Let's invite Jesus to come and fill our houses, our souls. Because he says like this, if you invite me in your house today, if you consider me as the honorary guest on a permanent basis of your house, guess what? He told his disciples, I go and prepare a place for you. And I will, be some, I will build some houses for you. I cannot wait to see that house that Jesus prepared for me in heaven.